Hi everybody, I'm Michael Goodman with Artmatcher, the mobile app connecting art lovers, artists, galleries, art fairs, and art events. While we continue to build a great experience, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today and check out Art Matcher in the Apple App Store and Google Play. All right, welcome to another episode of Art Matcher, the podcast. Joining us in the studio, I have Matt Lum, Kaylee. What's your last name? Darden Lum. Okay, they're going to hear that. And the one and only Sasha. Kriftsov. Yeah, so I, I'm not going <laughs> to butcher. Just give up. Yeah. I'm not going to bu- butcher another name uh, for the sake of these podcasts. Uh, uh, Sasha, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Um, yeah, my name is Sasha Krift. So first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. And um, I was born in Soviet Union in 1967, a long time ago. Um, I'm an artist, a photographer, a professional musician as well. And um, I came to United States in 91 and been here since then. I lived in New York for about a um, year and a half and then moved to Los Angeles and uh, moved here for the uh, music career, uh, for my music career. I've been um, in Russia, I've been in one of the probably most famous bands in Russia since I was 16 years old and had to finish school on the road. And, uh, How did that of- translate? Like, was there a big like culture shock of uh, going from the kind of Russian music industry to the United States at that time? Absolutely. I mean, the, there were no, there was no really Russian music industry. It was one record label. Uh, one record label was belonged to to the state, to to the government, and um, it was early '80s. It was about yeah, probably about three rock and roll bands allowed by government. So we toured like crazy. It was four or five shows a day. Was that funded by the government then at the time? Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. So yeah, it was yeah. like the musicians were working for the government. Yeah, exactly. All the right, because we sold about 32 million records there. I made 0.0 rubles. Wow. <laughs> so that was like mafia. That's like kind of... Well, it is. Yeah, it's Soviet Union. Yeah. Is it? So, and... Um, yeah, we toured a lot. We made good money touring. Um, I probably made a day what my father made a year, and he was like a professor, you know what I mean? So wow. it's, it's pretty wild, you know, and, uh, but again. Was that always the trajectory? Cause like, you're one of these kind of like, what I like to say, Renaissance artists, which we're gonna jump into kind of mm-hmm. your visual art, but kind of having this kind of start in music, which is interesting, which, I think a lot of people, they could only dream of being a rock star. So like when you were like in it, like, was that like, did you have that on your vision board? Like, I'm going to be playing like. Well, when I was a kid, I always wanted to just be a hockey player, like every other, you know, every other little boy in Russia. They just, you start start walking, they give you a stick and you (laughs) <laughs> they actually give you a shovel first to see which way you shovel the snow if it's your if you're right-handed or left-handed and then they'll give you a proper stick the and proper they stick. just kick you in the butt and you outside playing hockey all day long yeah but um i had so many injuries so at some point my mom just said enough and you're gonna play music so i started playing classical guitar since i was like five years old and um and uh, it just one thing led to another i was in this kids band and this Russian band, Zimlyani, which is, that's the name of the band that was really popular. Somehow they end up at that kid's show and they saw me and they're like, he's cute enough. We're going to take him. He's cute. He's marketable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and that's it. They just called my parents and the he, they just said, look, we're taking him on the road with us. And it wasn't like. At the time, were there a lot of encouraging parents for the arts? Because that, that's a lot on your parents to say, hey, we want our kid to say focus on music because I think a lot of parents yeah at least here in the I, west are not as encouraging yeah no it was just because it was nothing really like there's no internet there is no like 
television or telephones and all it is is just occupy your kid with something you know what i mean so and it just happened and i got really involved in music and i had great teachers in terms of music and the importance of having a good teacher you know until this day i'm thankful his name is andre and um he was my big, biggest influence, you know, so. So it was uh, like a mentor figure as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, he gave me all that love for music and practicing and and you see it in your kitchen and practice endlessly and stuff like that. And uh, But at the same time, I grew up in Leningrad, St. Petersburg now. It's uh, visually, in terms of arts, visually, it's incredible, architecturally incredible and Hermitage, you know, and and my parents took me to museums all the time, like, you know, my father did. And so the art was always present. Either so you were visually to, stimulated, stimulated at the constantly. same time. Yeah, constantly. So, so that's interesting. So going from that, those early kind of memories of Russia and then coming here, would you say a lot of the visuals that you do today, are they inspired from here or from maybe an earlier time because your work as we dive into it um if i had to describe it it i mean it's definitely stuff from your head because this stuff is not in reality a lot of it or did you did you actually take when you started painting did you mm -hmm. like did you try and like go like the realistic more tra traditional route because you are technically skilled yeah like i never i never had proper education in terms of art but art um in russia in schools even in kindergarten, so promoted. So you would have great teachers and like when you six years, whatever, five years old in kindergarten, you'll have like actually professional people teaching you arts and they're, it's very promoted in Russia. You know, so I'm sure that influenced me somehow, but um, my father could draw and uh, he was very artistic. And my parents always encouraged me to just express myself drawing. So I always found myself drawing stuff and, you know, photography, develop pictures and all that stuff. So did you find it was like, so that that's very interesting, kind of all that encouragement and stuff. Your main focus at the time when you were younger was music. And then obviously you segued mm -hmm. here, but were you creating at those early times? Is it like simultaneous? Like when was the time where you were like, cause like for the audience right now, this guy, like he paints, draws, like all the time as you're still yeah. practicing. Like I'll say you do it more than what I call artists who say this is their full-time job. You're doing it yeah, like constantly. Yeah, I do it literally every day. Uh, it's just like kind of, um, I don't wait for like inspiration. A lot of artists go like, I'm not inspired and stuff. I find inspiration in my own work by doing it, you know? So I'll come home and I, I just paint, you know, go to my studio and paint and doesn't matter. I just played for 10 hours um, on the voice. So I play bass on the voice, by the way. Um, and um, um, nonchalantly, which is a, one of the uh, biggest shows. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's a great gig. I'm, I'm in town. I don't have to travel. It's been 22 seasons of amazing freedom, changed my life, changed life of my kids and all that stuff. So. Um, so yeah, I paint, I create all the time and it's just necessity. I don't have images in my head. I don't ever, like very rarely I go to the canvas or whatever that I kind of have like, okay, this is what it should look like. But usually it just, I just have to do it. Some of the your larger scale works though, yep. when we're looking at your larger scale works, um, when I look at it, do you start with essentially like a drawing like walk us through your process of like after obviously mm -hmm. you just do it but is it like oh you know what i i paint the canvas gray like is there is there like a formal process or every every time it's kind of like a new experience it's kind of different experience all the time it depends what inspires me right so and again my style goes you can probably see by technique that it's the same artist, but stylistically, sometimes I feel like painting abstract paintings or figurative paintings or whatever it is, you know what I mean? So I don't put myself in a box, which is could be probably sometimes problem for galleries to figure out what the Yeah, hell. we talk about that kind yeah, of like yeah. branding 
Well, re- relating it back to music, like, would you say, like, as a musician, as a musician, do you have to have a certain style of music, and that's your framework of it? Like, a lot of musicians do, but with the nature of my my gig right now on the voice, we have to play every style of music, okay. you know, from country to pop to rock to Motown, whatever, you know what I mean? So you just kind of, it's you really- You have the skill set to do that. Yeah, then. you just have to have skill set to do it. And that's why that the band on the voice, just incredible. Just literally, I, I've been, to, we've been together for a long time, even before the voice and then so fortunate to play with oh, those guys. Oh, so these are players you've played with. It's not like- Yeah, uh, yeah, we played with, uh, we did four years with Cher in uh, uh, Las Vegas, we did that. We were on TV shows prior to that called Rockstar in Excess and Rockstar Supernova. So it's me, musical director, Paul Merkovich and Nate Morton uh, is a drama. We've been together for like, I don't know, 18, 19 years to play together. That's so interesting because yeah. when I think about like bands like on The Voice, I think of the same formats of like the late night show mm-hmm. and stuff. Is that similar to that? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we get so many. So like we uh, we recorded because we record for iTunes as well. Everything I think we recorded close to seven thousand songs. So it must be like I think it is like most recorded band ever. Wow, that's a massive, so, like, like crazy amount of songs. You know what I mean? So, and we've seen thousands of contestants. So every time, every week, songs change. So you have to new songs, new arrangements, new like it's pretty involved gig. But wow, so you have to you have to study the music as well. Then, I right? read, I side read. So um, I read music. So I just literally show up. My tech puts my iPad on the stand, and I have all the charts, and I just read. It's like reading book, you know. So lucky enough, I learned how to read music when I was. A I, kid. I was um, I was uh, talking to a buddy of mine who does music, and mm-hmm. I guess he like he plays by ear. But this he couldn't do this gig then because no, you you no. gotta know. You, you just have to know. You gotta know, like in any song, because we play covers, obviously, for the most part, you know, like ninety percent of it, it's a cover song. So you have to learn the song the way it is. Yeah, and then no. and then you can you know if there's different arrangement then you can. Are you guys uh, ever like, oh man, like you you guys check each other like, oh man, that dude messed up? Or no, like, uh, we don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, out of nope, the seven thousand, you is, mess up, you perfect. out, you're out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, no, but it's it's very like it's it's insane like musicianship and that this band is ridiculous. Because I, I think I see a lot when I look at your work visually. I think there is a lot of musical inspiration by it mm-hmm. because the fluidity of your work. A lot of yeah. things seem to flow. There's like a lot of notes, like kind of like looking shape things in your work. Yeah, I think that's the main thing. Like I love shapes, you know. So that's why you know I get inspired by nature. But like, I'll go to the beach and like a carpinteria and spend three hours looking at rocks, you know, whenever I have three hours. Whenever, which is like never, uh, which is never. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it like, you know, kind of making art in between when you're when you're doing your other gig? Um, well, I. I create a lot actually in my dressing room too. I like if we doing like a portion of the show that runs for six weeks. So I just set up art studio in my dressing room. So I just paint while I'm like, we'll go on stage, we film, then we have two hours in between. I'll come to the dressing room and I'll paint. Well, sometimes I come, I mean, I come home and I'll paint uh, downstairs. I have a big counter. You've been to my house. and. Um, in the kitchen, I don't even go to the studio. It's kind of like it's just complete. it's just like a, something I'll watch some documentary or some like old film or whatever. Not really paying attention to that. Not really paying attention to what I'm drawing. Do you ever you just know, like reflect like like on it? Like maybe you were having a bad day, and then you look at the work, and you're just like, yeah. I mean, that's I'm, bad. Energy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's um, it's totally done by like intuition and luck and mistakes leading to images you know what i mean so it's again the smaller work i really never i just feel like okay i'm gonna start doing something and then it just before you know it it comes out and then of course maybe it reflects your certain mood or what happened that day or maybe what happened whatever a year ago 
Do you have no. a medium that you gravitate more to that you kind of lean into in terms of like, yeah, you have like this? Because just so the audience understands, like he has amassed a vault, a, 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 um, a catalog of work that I, I don't think some people will will sometimes do in their life. And to put it in perspective, I've had many artists and um, even Matt, who's an artist here in our studio, when if you if you ask someone what is their output a year right of of art it could be matt just showed me a sign of like 10 he does he could do 10 in a day i put my money on it right yeah i've done maybe three four a day sometimes and it just it's yeah i have a storage full of art which is kind of silly and stupid i pay for my own art every month you know so but no, I, I don't have a place at home. So it, that stops me actually uh, from making very large scales. I mean, I do have very large scale paintings, but at, that, at this point, I was like, I, I, I start doing them just not stretch canvas. I'll just roll them. You'll roll it up. I'll roll it up. You know what I mean? So somebody has to see it all the time. We can fill up every gallery in LA. In, in LA, <laughs> yeah. every gallery that hears this, we have art for you. No, but it, it's it's interesting because then to me, it, it goes back to kind of like why artists create why they create. And I think every artist's process is very different when they think about the mm -hmm. ideas that they're trying to communicate and the visual language. And kind of what I've learned about your work and kind of looking at it is that a lot of this, um, the way I interpret it is a lot of like subconscious thought and stuff because absolutely you, yeah when 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 we curated uh, the last exhibition um we were looking at some 20 images collectively and when you look at your work in that sense you can kind of see these different ideas and stories and we sold a couple of them as well and it's interesting the way people identify with the work like there was a there was there's and i think i've told you this before there's like a lot of religious influence in your work you know, with the crosses. And that's why, like, I know kind of going back to what you've told me of like mm -hmm. kind of where you grew up and this kind of the churches and stuff. Yeah, it's it's definitely there. And I don't, I really don't know like why, not why, but uh, I'm not a religious person at all. You know, so I'm spiritual, but I don't go to church. I don't, but I went to churches in Russia just for the sake of beauty and sight. You know, there's certain energy and churches that built in like 1400s and 1500s there's certain energy and the icons uh is just in terms of technical abilities you know it's just beautiful icons and stuff it's always for some reason i always gravitated to that oh cemeteries you know russian cemeteries are beautiful like in st petersburg you know old cemeteries it's like inter it's sculpture garden you know what i mean so i always and it was actually legal to go to church in russia Illegal. Could, illegal yeah during the time during the soviet union you could not go to what was the reasoning behind that i it just the separated religion and and uh, communist propaganda you're not you weren't allowed to believe in god you can go to jail if you like per se you know it's, it's crazy. weird hearing these ideas and knowing like something happened because like it's interesting your experiences with like kind of like the soviet union and it's mm -hmm. like i hear about it but i don't know about it and so I can only know about it is by like hearing stories from people of like who kind of experience because like I have different uh, friends from Russia, some younger, some older, and it's amazing kind of like the different experiences of like the life some people are living now in retrospect to like what it was. <laughs> Yeah, like well, now, and night. now we're back to, <laughs> we just took a step back about 100 years with all this <laughs> war with Ukraine happening, you know what I mean? Just terrible. But um, yeah, I mean, and it was changing, like my sister is four years younger than me, and she has completely different experiences. So it was changing like very frequently, you know Rapidly what I mean? Too, Rapidly, yeah. yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, like when I was growing up, you couldn't listen to band kiss you know you could go to jail for listening literally they can put you to jail for five years for listen if you get busted for listening band kiss so on or watch american movies so the accessibility to it then too is much harder than oh, what we have today almost impossible like in, impossible literally had to go like on a black market and get like some tapes and group of like 
like how they, on VHS, that's how we used to watch the American movies and neighbors would call to KGB and KGB will come to the apartment building, shut down the lights. This way, old VHS, you could not get the v the actual tape out if the lights are off. That's how people will get busted, uh, get arrested. And I got, you know, beat up in my own apartment by KGB, you know what I mean? Wow. For no reason whatsoever, because on my Russian band, we travel a lot, so we would bring some foreign goods to sell per se, you know, because there was nothing in Russia and somebody, one of the neighbors saw me coming home with like a bunch of, you know, boxes with like some American writing. So they called KGB and they just raided my apartment thinking that I am like, because, because you could not sell for profit there because that's, you go to jail for that. So that's like, it's, it's so wild, like kind of hearing it and thinking like, wow, that was a, a certain time where just people kind of had to adhere to certain things. Yep. I want to know you've, you've traveled quite a bit yep. because of your music career. Mm -hmm. Is there a place that kind of strikes you where there was like an aha, like I went to like this place and it just changed my perspective. Kind of yeah. like what places like shaped kind of Paris. Paris. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, Matt is uh, just a little side note. He asked me a couple of weeks ago, should he move to Paris? And I said, you're young enough to, it doesn't matter. So just go live in Paris for however long you want to yeah, do it. Yeah, just go live anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You're, you know? you're, you're getting an endorsement here from the, from oh, the man no, it, himself. It was amazing. You know, well, maybe because I was coming from Soviet Union and then we went to Paris and it was like, oh my God, it's like, I literally, until this day, every time I visit, I go for a walk for like 10 hours. You know, it's like everywhere you look is just incredible. It's artistic. It's just artistic. The vibe of the city, the, you know, just the smell of creating. Cre would you want to live there? That's a real question. I don't know. I mean, I never, I stayed there for like three, I mean, two and a half months or whatever it is. I was great, but living somewhere is completely different, you know, from, I always want to be in America for some reason, you know what I mean? From yeah, that's, living, that's, 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 that's the, you know, you know, I read Fenimore Cooper books about Indian tribes and I just want to be, dude with the bow and arrow, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> You're gonna hunt not, your own. Not great, and now I'm being I'm politically incorrect, sorry, yeah. Indian people. Yeah. <laughs> Cut that. You, you, you have, you have, well, you know, it's it's so funny. I was, I was telling people contextually of like, yeah, yeah. you know, there's nothing that's correct, incorrect. It's, it's just how we perceive and take it in. Um, that's yes. interesting. So Paris was the, 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 the place that, yes. that clicked for you, like kind of like, artistically do you find like when when traveling in these places were there like artists along the way that you said oh wow like because you're self-taught like mm -hmm. but where where did you like who's the one who started kind of mentoring you in art then if any at all well growing up back in the soviet union we it were there weren't many like contemporary or modern artists and stuff. It most more like uh, was more uh, social realism, like you know propaganda art and all that stuff. Like realistic art was promoted, but like Picasso and you know, like even those kind of guys weren't really, you know, really, but, yeah. But then like mid eighties, you you could go to Hermitage and see Matisse and Picasso and all that, but. Then in Paris, I went to Pompidou in the center of Pompidou, and then um, then you get introduced to Francis Bacon, and then your life changed. You know, I mean, so you go, "Holy crap!" What I was going to say because, like, <laughs> you know? if I, I if I had to say to like describe yeah. your work visually of what if someone said, "Hey, what does this work look like on this podcast?" I'd say some works could be the love child between Francis Bacon and Dali. Yeah, yeah. Dali, absolutely. Somehow Dali was accepted and. and in really? Russia, so you could get a hold of like books of Dali for some reason, you know what I mean? Was so, it probably because we're politically aligned or something? I don't People, know. I, think... I mean, Picasso was like in the Communist Party for a second too. So was he? Like, yeah, like during, I, 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 yeah, he 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 <laughs> was, you know. And um, so yeah, I mean, like, even Beatles weren't like going back to music weren't allowed. Only one song they played every New Year's Eve is back in U back in the USSR thinking that this singing about they going they were telling us like see even beatles want to come and live in the ussr <laughs> so so dumb no nah, it's it's yeah. it's it's very fascinating propaganda man 
there's, you know, you have this kind of worldview of like kind of a world of how it was. And here in America, anything goes. I mean, today, if like yeah. whatever you want to do, you could be, there's no limit. You know, you want to be a tree today? Well, I'll address you as a great redwood if you want to. Cool idea. And it, it, could, it could pass. So yeah. it's, it's interesting, like, um, you know, when, when, when I think about art and, and maybe I'll ask this about your music and stuff. Is there like, because you've done, I don't want to say you've done everything in music, but you've done everything that you feel like you needed to do in a music career. But do you ever find yourself looking to push the envelope of like, oh, you know what, I'm going to write a, a song with my band or something like no i i don't i i don't want to sound too cocky about it but music at this point it's very it's come so naturally and easy because uh my music career have been for what 40 years at this point you know what i mean so um i don't i find art is more limitless you know what i mean so music is very like structural form of, like i'm talking about popular music or whatever, you know what I mean? So, and music always been my money maker. So I treat music that way as well. I mean, I don't, it's always a question to me, like, oh, I should probably dive in and play, like get really like play jazz music and stuff like that. Yeah, you can dive in and, and educate yourself that way, but you're gonna make like $75 a year, you know what I mean? I so was gonna, I was gonna, when you said <laughs> jazz music, my experience with jazz music, and maybe I just don't have the ear for it. Mm -hmm. I hate good jazz music, meaning I know good jazz music is like, like it's, it's the point where you don't understand anything. Yeah. I'm like, okay, this is beyond my kind of like scope of my ears. Cause I'll be honest, I like commercial good. Yeah. That's what I consider good music. Nothing wrong with that. You but, know, I mean, yeah, jazz music is just literally, you gotta really study and really, it just, well, music is form of communication, right? So and it's like, if you have to like, super high-end professors talking to each other, you probably won't understand like half of the crowd is saying, you know what I mean? So it's kind of jazz music in a sense. Yeah, it's a it very its... intelligent way of communicating by playing your instrument and with each other, you know what I mean? So, and, so yeah, for average people, even musicians, it's hard to understand or, you know, I mean, I can fake it good enough, you know, for average listener, it'll be, oh my God, he plays jazz. but. True jazz, true jazz music, musician. You, you know your lane. And so what yeah. would you say, like, because right now the thing you're doing, it's an open format, you have to do everything. Yep. Is there something that you would say, like, oh yeah, this is what he's known, you're known for in the music industry in that sense? Like, I don't know, you could shred the bass or something. I don't Yeah. Um No, I, I just like I said, I mean it's it's like we cover every the beauty of this band that like if we play a country song it sounds like a country band from Nashville. If you play an R&B song, it sounds like a bunch of musicians that grew up listening to R&B, you know, it's... So I don't know what's the specialty. I mean, maybe, I mean, I played rock all my life, so maybe rock, but I love... If you have an affinity to it. But Motown music, that's what speaks the most to me, like Marvin Gaye and all that. So I, I love playing that music. And I've done gigs when people come to me like, oh yeah, you really feel this, you know, so... Because I, I, I had an experience with music. Uh, I went to an art school where it was a uh, multi kind of discipline. We had visual artists, mm -hmm. we had musicians, we had actors. And uh, one of my friends went to Juilliard and she studied um, viola. And they have like these sight reading parties. It was like the biggest nerd fest you could ever go to. Like just a bunch, uh, Matt was yeah. there actually. He, uh, he was there uh, assisting me, making sure people paid their dues to come to this party. <laughs> And uh, this was a couple of years, a couple of years back when I went to the first one, and I could finally, like, I felt like I could appreciate. I don't want to say classical, like classical instruments, yeah. where I was able to singly, like, hear a certain instrument. I'm like, is this what musicians always do? Like, they could, like, and I want to say, like, the, the guy who was playing, he's like the first chair violinist. Mm -hmm at the uh, LA Phil, so it's like, yeah. he's, a, he's a big time, like he's really good. But I was like, wow, it was like, it was like the most serene experience I ever had. And I wonder if that happens in different formats where, and I think you're the perfect person to ask because you're a professional musician in that sense of like, is that the experience like where you can sing? Cause like when the whole orchestra comes together, it's one, one thing and it's beautiful, but when you could just, 
wow, like just appreciate why that is the way it is or why that the violin. I, I yeah, well, just, I, I think it's uh, comes as any profession, like super pro guys, you see super basketball player, you know, you look at LeBron, you're going, how the, like what? You know, so you get amazed by you just when you're on top of your game and anything you do, I think that's going to give that effect, you know what I mean? So that's what I. Well, so I there think. are you like, so you being in that league of yeah. like, I mean, how many musicians get to say they've kind yeah. of had a career like you've had in music to say that and professionally kind of mm -hmm. even be in business of music. Not many can say that. Not too many. Yeah. The, it's, it's a lot of musicians in this, especially in this town, a lot of people come in, but it's, I would say maybe what group of 25 musicians, 30 musicians that work all the time. So when you get on that level, you don't need to audition for things. You just get a call to do things and do records and stuff like that. And, um, yeah, like, I mean, coming from Russia, I don't think anybody ever accomplished as a musician what I come again, I'm not going like, look at me, look at me, but it just, that's a fact, you know, in the classical world, there are plenty of Russian musicians, like in Philharmonia and stuff like that. But yeah. in terms of pop rock and all that stuff, I, it just happened again. I'm the only one since I came here that actually done something on a, on something. a yeah that did something on the highest level in terms of playing with this 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 and this you know plays a lot of people so that's why I think I told you before that if my music career stops tomorrow I'm totally cool with that you know what I mean because yeah. I played I accomplished all my dreams, whatever my dreams were in terms of music so that's why art is like I literally want to have a place like some place where I can just create all the time because I want to work with wood I want to work with on giant sculptures and all that stuff you know what I mean so yeah tell me about like your first shows of where you felt like you started arriving because before the exhibition we did you had done some exhibitions before so what was that experience like kind of navigating the art world because even where you're at in the art world right now I mean for someone like me who this is all I do this is all I know yeah. You know, you're still much further ahead of where I'd say most artists. I don't, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm much farther ahead because I really never, I mean, I've done ex exhibits like KP, Project Gallery, Mary Kronofsky. I know her for a while. We've been friends per se, you know, and I love her. I've done a show. She's discovered gallery. though big talents. I mean, she's yeah, yeah. With the... She's great, and I, I've I've done a, a retrospective show at at her place a few years ago, like maybe ten years ago. I show like seventy two pieces of art. A lot of times I do. I I work with different galleries, but I find myself, um, as you know, art business is really weird. Like I would have a deal. I have a deal with this gallery. Um, I'm not going to name the gallery, but it, it was in Studio City. And uh, we got a deal to put my paintings up and they sold one. And then they all, then they called me up and they said, can I come to the gallery? I go to the gallery. They said, look, we'll like your backgrounds on the paintings, but the figures are too freaky. People don't buy it. Can we just, can you give us something? Just eliminate the figures. Can we just have a background? <laughs> So uh, I just went to Yuho, uh, I said, I'll be back. I went to, I got the Yuho truck, walk into the gallery, load everything out and pick up everything pick up and just go peace out. You know, they're like, wait, what? I'm like, okay, bye. We were just having you this know? discussion earlier of like someone, you know, asking what's the difference between like commercial art and fine art. I think in music, it's pretty clear maybe. Mm -hmm. um, in art, it's kind of what the intention of it is. So it's, in the, fa in the fact that, you know, you have a gallerist who's saying, hey, we want you to paint a certain way. It's taking away from the artistry of it. Absolutely. That's the whole fun of it. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's interesting, like, you know, like, and that, that's why I find it so fascinating with your music career. Because with your music career, you're like, you're just subject to play whatever, like, is thrown at you. And you're able to do it. Yeah. And, and that's why it's with art, to me, it's like, it just really come from my heart or whatever it's come from. And I don't want to compromise because it's not my main source of income. So I don't have that pressure. And and a lot of artists probably have that pressure. That, that is that is a true struggle of like, absolutely. I have who do. Who... Yeah, absolutely. Because if you know, like if I know I can just, I mean, I can make a lot of money doing art because I know what sells, like, but why, you know? I yeah. do that with music. Yeah, and that, that, that's the fascinating thing uh, yeah. to me 
where the kind of the treatment of it is different. Cause a lot of artists like just, just as, as you have the kind of tools in your stable to play anything, let's say a lot of visual artists who come from, let's say an illustration background, Mm -hmm. a lot of illustrators are phenomenal. Like they can paint like really well. And there's artists who take that route. And then there's artists who kind of like, it's more passion driven of, of what you're doing. And I would think like a thing that you lead in that you were like, you must like, I think, I think music, you do need to have like some type of aptitude for it from a young age. Cause I think some people, they really gravitate to it. I know I wasn't one of them. My parents tried to get me to play like the piano mm-hmm. and the guitar. It just, I feel like I would be actually a very good music judge though, like Simon Cowell or something. Well, there you go. <laughs> I've predicted a lot of, uh, a lot of artists that people said, nah, these guys won't make it. And I was like, oh, I. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe that's the question to you. How do you select um, artists for as a gallerist? You know what I mean? How do you select artists to represent them? You know what I mean? So based on there's there's a like huge the, balance. I'm, I'm sure it's a different level of like well, long you, careers, short careers, quick money make. No, it, it, it really depends know. how I'm looking at the art itself. And uh, today we did a studio visit with an artist who had a show in a museum, for instance, and mm-hmm. when talking to the artist about his work and how he felt on it, just even where he's trying to go with his art aligns with the program that I'm putting together. So what I'm, I'm, I'm interested in artists that aren't chasing the dollar. We know the dollar. I like that you can comfortably talk about it Yeah. Um, because a lot of people like to think that like, oh, if there's a monetary aspect, you know, it's not pure no everything has a monetary aspect to it so it has to, to be it helps you to develop it help, gives you more freedom to, to do reinvest. more reinvest and develop and travel and see and you know what i'm saying and be inspired and absolutely percent yeah. and it gets to a point where hopefully you know you get to a point where you have a nest egg or something where you could say okay i could really do the fun stuff mm-hmm. and so what i look for in artists is artists that one are really about what they want to do. One of the things I always say is if I have to tell you what to paint, I don't want to represent you because then that's another job. Yeah. Now I have to be honest if I could sell what you're painting and that that's always, that's the trickiest part about the art industry because there is something for everyone. And it's about, can you find those people? Can you, um, uh, kind of make it. So even though I started working with you recently, it's like, it's, it's, it's like a marathon. You have to like, Oh, absolutely. certain people and, and, and certain galleries, much like how you can play everything. My gallery, um, we weren't like KP projects where we specialize in some mm-hmm. niche of what would be considered maybe outsider art or illustration. Mm-hmm. She has a broad yeah, yeah. also program to a certain extent, but still they have their like, Oh, this, they definitely have, they the have niche, a yeah. style yeah. Um, that they prefer. So I, I welcomed all styles and kind of all different walks of life, as long as I felt like they were taking it seriously and they were taking it in a serious manner. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of great talented artists that I wanted to represent, but as a person, they were terrible. So it's like, that's another thing. Like you may have a talented musician, but if he doesn't show up to play the gig, then is it worth it? Oh yeah, that's that's what makes you to the high level, that it's like combination of everything. Of everything, the networking and all that. Absolutely. I think what's changing today in the art market is uh, consumers are going more direct. So as gallerists, the the narrative of what a gallery needs to do is just different. Um, There'll always be a need for a wall and and something to fill it. Yeah, Um, how do galleries deal at this point with that? Because like I get, I do a lot of sales, just people literally look at my Instagram and contact you directly. And of course they understand that I buy art for my own collection, contacting directly artists because obviously for financial benefits of it, you know what I mean? So, the, but the gallery, I guess it's still important to have a gallery if, if gallery believes in you and build your career in the long run. Well, think about it I mean? of having a music agent. Yep. You know, what What are they good for? I don't know, collecting the 10%. Collecting, you know? so there, you, it, it's it's interesting. So that- I don't I, have I don't have an agent, no it did. I, I, I like you said that, but no, but you said you, you, you actually answered it, which is yeah. interesting, collecting the 10%. <laughs> yeah. You're right, they collect their own 10%, but they also, it's, it's a lot easier for someone else to ask for money than yourself. That's been proven. Oh yeah, and, and, then, and I mean, the way, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but the way 
like working with you, and that was our first show together, the way you organized the show, how it was created. It was amazing. It was an incredible job because it was three artists, completely different. And I was like, how the hell is Michael going to do this? And you did it. You know, I was worried for a little bit. <laughs> Because no, they're so was, drastically different. It, yeah, very drastically. But it fell, and it was one room, but it still felt like three different shows and one room with different experiences. You know, so like kudos to you and that. You know, Thank so. you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of moving parts, and I think I think the roles of galleries in the future um, is going to be more management, kind of like how a CAA mm -hmm. or UTA. UTA actually represents artists, yeah. uh, CAA as well, and I think you know it's going to be adding value, and I think. Artists, once they get to a, a big enough scale, they run these studios. We literally just visited a studio today, um, Kaylee and I, where the guy's doing fine. You know, he's doing fine in terms of what he's doing and mm -hmm. he has his collectors and everyone. But the question is, uh, my philosophy is how can I add value? So I know maybe for your next show, you'll think twice about curating your own show. You might be like, you know what? I want to get a curator. No, the way, the, did, the way you did, the way you did, that's, I mean, yeah, I, no. I don't want to be involved in curating after you did it, you know, because a lot of shows I've done, I created myself, you know, so it's a lot of work and it's, you know. Uh, yeah, and finding out the right combo. And I think that yeah. that's the thing about putting together a team. I think at the height of the gallery, you're going to see like big gallery, like when you mm -hmm. go to the big galleries, like Gagosian, Blum and Poe, yeah, of course, those yeah. are institutions and they have a lot of resources to promote that, but it's also promoting a brand of, how you even talk about work. So here I have the privilege of talking to you, but when you're not, when someone, when your work is being shown somewhere else, do you trust the person to then talk about your work in a favorable light? Cause that could be uh, a really good thing or it could be a disaster if someone's like, you know, not talking about the work in a way where you're like, oh man, that doesn't make me look good. So mm -hmm. there's a whole art to it. And I think the um, the future of it's going to be these partnerships where like any good business where you have two people, they find the best way for them to work together, much how like a band plays together. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's been tons of talented musicians, but you'll just choose the guys you just know like i don't think you need to well speak yeah about i mean yeah absolutely yeah it's it all about happens. who you surround who you're hanging out with you know on the off time that's more important than what you do business together you know what i mean so yeah and it's like the, back to the same i what you were saying that you gotta like the person to work as a person to work with uh, work with and, and yeah. COVID changed a lot of things like to think yeah. about like two years ago going outside of the house was like a scary thing for some people. Not for me. I was never scared. Just me neither. That was the best time. <laughs> no, I know there was no, no traffic. traffic. Yeah. We said it. <laughs> he values time. That means I value time. <laughs> too. Exactly. You know, just like, Oh, I was so happy when there were no cars yeah. on the road. I, <laughs> I, I shouldn't say this, but I felt like I, yep. I was one of the deserving people. <laughs> yeah. And like COVID I didn't, I mean, we, um, I like being by myself. I don't mind being by myself. It's freaked a lot of people out because a lot of people don't know how to be with themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and of course, traffic and all that stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of people died and all that. But yeah, you know? it was. Uh, I just was speaking to my brother, who's a doctor, and I was asking him like, what are the highest cause of deaths? One was like, I think, uh, something like respiratory. The second one was COVID. Like it, yeah. it ranked like, and it's kind of hard to think like that, that, that surpassed a lot of the things, but yeah. we, we do live in a different world now of like how experiences are. How do you feel about digital art? That's a Is good that question. A I kind of thought that you're going to ask that. Uh, <laughs> I had a um, couple of meetings with uh, NFT guys. Um, I don't know. I, I, Still, I mean, again, I'm not saying it's bad or all good or whatever it is. I just maybe I just don't understand fully. I get the idea that it's ownership. That's what you're selling on NFTs and blah, blah, blah. I still don't understand the difference between if you have two exactly the same digital images, how is that? Why is one is 10 million and another one five dollars? You know what I mean? So I just mean the same image. Like yeah. Well, I mean, if you buy like I, that's what I'm saying, I'm not educated enough on the nft to even i think it's interesting it, nft you know? is so, like a medium that yeah. i look at it like the non-fungible token and yeah it's like essentially i mean we assign value uh you know 
anything is worth what someone's willing to pay. But I think it's um, when you look at digital art, the NFT is like the medium that now protects of what could be scarce. So someone asked me like, mm -hmm. well, I could just take a photo of it. I'm like, you could take a photo of the Mona Lisa and it's still not the Mona Lisa, right? We could agree to that, right? Oh, that of course, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So you can take a photo of the Mona Lisa, right? Print out a very high quality print. Maybe that's gonna look exactly like the Mona Lisa. Fool a lot of people, but it's still not the Mona Lisa, right? So now let's take the concept of if the medium was already digital, like it was created online, it's still there's that could be a one of one that could be the unique aspect of it. But on the digital, can you just drag it in your computer and it's gonna look exactly because it's created digitally? So there is no brush strokes, there is no, you know what I'm saying? So that's there are why I'm there's coming. like digital strokes, and that's it's interesting because I had an artist. That's a good name for the band, <laughs> digital strokes. All right, go daddy, get get the domain. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I had an artist, he did a piece on Illustrator mm -hmm. and the client commissioned it and we printed it out on canvas. And if you look at this canvas, you would think it was hand painted. Mm -hmm. It's that convincing his, he painted it in Illustrator though. Yeah, well, I do it at work too. It's so easy. Yeah, so then when you- know, you, it's on when, the iPad, it's like- I, But I, that's your IP, that's, you that's, created yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I create. So yeah. what is like, the NFT is the vessel that carries mm -hmm. the IP. That's all it is. Yeah. Now yeah. you can decide, um, do I wanna sell that image a million times or one of one? Meaning, are you gonna lock yeah, yeah. it and say, only one person has the ownership of the one? Because yes, you can duplicate it a million times, but if you said, hey, I only created one of this for like exchange, then there's yeah. just one. Yeah. But well, that's up to you. And then, you know, it's the whole part of the blockchain technology. For me, um, I just like to ask artists how they feel about creating work in that digital it, work. Do you I have, mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, again, it's so mind blowing and amazing how this could be. I still don't understand how facts works. You know, I mean, yeah. so going to understand it like NFT, I just don't. Yeah. I mean, it's all it's all good. I mean, just I like thought a I'm, fax was way more complex. Than it's anything. crazy. It's like when you, you think paper and back in the day, the, the role. Do, do yeah. you guys even know what a fax is? They oh yeah, oh like, yeah. The role. I remember <laughs> when I was living overseas, and my dad would fax something, and it would come. They say they predicted some French guy predicted the fax like a hundred years before it mm -hmm. even came out. Like he had yeah. a prediction Shall of this be. device. It's insane. And it's like, yeah, yeah it is kind yeah, of yeah. funny. It's I funny. never understood the technology of how you feed it in. And, and it's somewhere out. in the well, other, because it, it seems out. so archaic that like, how is this paper being fed in one way? Exactly. And being said, yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I never that's, really studied. That's my I just, problem. I thought it was a wizard, <laughs> wizard dream. Totally. So we're so, just about at our end of our rope here. Where mm -hmm. can uh, people find your artwork? Where can we put um, it? I have an Instagram. It's uh, Sasha Kriftsov underscore. You're gonna to wanna to spell that out. Uh, oh yeah, them. exactly. So S A S H A Sasha. Uh Kriftsov is K R I V as in Victor, T as in Tom, S as in Sam, O V as in Victor, underscore art, underscore photography. So yeah, I do so you, I do photography as well. You guys can play that back too, and we'll have probably a link in bio as well. Yeah. Uh to share this. So this is a two segment part where we have a, a lot of fun people in the studio today making yeah. this happen. Yeah. And the last thing I want to say is just I hope to bring the art education back to schools in America. Yeah, I it's, think that's uh, very that's, important. It's very important. I think that's I think it's prop. What is that? Twenty eight or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but it's really important. I mean, because I have children, I saw like what happened in schools, how it's got wiped out, and I think creativity. If you make kids be creative at school. With, through arts and music, it leads to other venues of being creative in other fields of, you know, and, and they become engineers or whatever, whatever it is. It just opens up your vision. Yeah, if, I couldn't you know agree I mean? more. I think uh, that's one of the things that I took away from this kind of segment today is like, yeah. you know, it is important for kind of the older parents listening, you know, to not dis- uh, encourage kind of like as if they can't make a career because clearly I'm looking in front of someone who's had a, a very successful and continuous uh, career going on in, in music yeah. and in art. So until next time, guys, thanks so much. Thanks so much. 
Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.